Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Condo Insider. And uh, my name is Jane Sugimura, and I am your host uh, for this episode. And Condo Insider is the you know show for uh, uh, people who live and uh, work in condominiums uh, or who have anything to do with condominium association. And you know today we're going to talk about a topic that I've been you know talking a lot about and you know maybe writing about and. And it's an issue that people keep grumbling to me about. And that's the city ordinance, the fire safety ordinance 19-4. And um, as my guest today is our champion in the city council, council member, <laughs> Carol Fukunaga. Aloha. Hi, Carol. How are you, Jane? Thank you for being my guest today. Uh, we're here on almost my favorite topic, uh, because, you know, we keep getting comments, you know, from uh, associations as to how did we get to this place? You know, we have this ordinance that is, you know, <clears throat> creating all kinds of issues. Right. And, you know, when the when the ordinance was first drafted, I mean, it came about because of the condo fire at Marco Polo in 2017. Right. Absolutely. And, right. And and, you know, uh, and and over the years, the implementation has been spotty and it, it's just become unmanageable and it's created a lot of stress with condo associations because of the deadlines, uh, the cost involved. And so, you know, what is what is the status of it now, of this ordinance? Okay, well, the ordinance is uh, still in existence. You know, we have uh, tackled this ordinance many times over the last five or six years. And uh, the bill was amended this year to extend some of the deadlines, you know, at least by five years in each instance. And so for those who choose to pursue uh, improvements, you know, fire safety improvements, rather than installing uh, fire sprinklers, they have up until 2030. However, unanticipated uh, challenges over the last two to three years have really turned this what we thought was going to be a pretty straightforward, you know, you could either take one route or you could take another route. We have found that there have been so many issues and problems. Number one, the deadlines um, were unrealistic at the outset. And so as we have faced new challenges, they've had to be modified and pushed back over time. Uh, the pandemic created supply chain issues, you know, which also contributed to increased costs for regular repair and maintenance, and it makes it more difficult to obtain estimates for life safety evaluation upgrades in order to get a passing score. So on top of all of that, really, um, things that we had absolutely no control over, uh, there was a Florida condo collapse several years ago. And so last year, you know, you and others alerted us to the fact that uh, the federal, what is it, HUD um, issued directives that took effect on January 1, 2022 to member banks that they ought not to make loans to condos who had any kind of significant deferred maintenance or unsafe conditions or had um, you know failed to make appropriate repairs uh, or take corrective actions in their buildings so but you know council member with respect yes. to that i just heard you know and i would i don't want to mention the bank but i just heard um you know um from some of my uh constituents that there's a local bank that's not making loans because of that directive. And, you know, when we're talking about loans, we're talking loans to association to do repair and maintenance, loans to unit owners if they want to do, um, uh, you know, if they want to do renovations or if they want to refinance, except in this market, who would want to refinance? They probably have 3% mortgages, but, you know, and, uh, you know, it, it's going to affect uh, prospective buyers who want mortgages. Right. And, and and so we're we're being told that um you know that issue about you know having deferred maintenance that this bank is saying that a failed LSE constitutes grounds to deny a loan because that failed LLC is filed it's public record it's filed with the enforcement agency which is the Honolulu Fire Department. Wow, that is. So really... I think maybe if you're going to be working on an amendment, we need to clarify that. So that you know, it takes it out of that realm of maybe this is 
you know, a, a, an issue regarding deferred maintenance that's going to trigger the HUD directive that you don't make loans. We can't have that. We we really do have to bring you know all the parties to the table. And you know the the other condition that was unexpected was the fact that the insurance industry started increasing the premiums on residential high rise. Um, what is it? Premiums for multifamily residential buildings. And so I have been receiving complaints about insurance increases that are more than fifty percent almost, you know, in some instances, maybe more than double, you know, within the last year. And so many buildings, even those that have um, pursued, you know, corrective action to life safety evaluation improvements, but have not completed that process yet, they're being hit with higher and higher premiums. So I think everybody uh, within, you know, the uh, 309 condo properties that are subject to this law all had, um, some really difficult challenges to face this year. And, and I think that's why we're all receiving so many concerns. Well, you know, when you talk about getting the, the, you know, the players together, you might want to in include the insurance commissioner who has yes. allowed these insurance increases to go up and, and remind him that that ordinance 19-4 expressly uh, exempts high rise buildings with open exterior corridors from putting in fire sprinklers, they're exempt. So if you have an ordinance that says, hey, you know, and, and this would be, I, I know, uh, what is it? I, I think it's the Wailana, one, mm -hmm. one building, and, and the Yacht Harbor Tower. Right, right. They have open exterior quarters. Their insurance went up. Yes. I mean, they got huge increases. And, you know, you have one ordinance that says, oh, no, you're exempt. You don't have to do it. And then you have the state saying, hey, no, you don't have a fire sprinkler. So you, now you got to pay higher insurance. That just doesn't sound right. That's absolutely correct. And so part of what we did was uh, we sent uh, letters to 309 condo high-rise buildings and uh, shared with them the contents of the fire department's August 2022 report, which did list, you know, of the, I guess, of the buildings that had filed their life safety evaluations. It listed uh, the scoring within a variety of categories, you know, six of the most troublesome categories, and it reflected a very low acceptance rate of only 20 buildings out of the 275 condo properties that had submitted their life safety evaluations. Only 20 received acceptable scores. So that means, you know, 255 high-rise buildings are sort of stuck trying to address or correct or improve their scores by putting in either more improvements or changing what they were planning to do. And I think that is a huge, huge problem as we also have many, many challenges at Department of Planning and Permitting. Right, and you know, with that, that issue with 255 buildings, and you know, with, and, I, and our building is one, we are one of the 255 buildings that didn't get a passing score. And our licensed professional is telling us, you know, just upgrade your fire alarm system. But that's about, you know, which is cheaper than putting in fire sprinklers. It's about a million dollars, but it requires a building permit. And so if, if you know, at, if at least 200 of the buildings of the 255 need building permits, how are we gonna get them? I mean, it just seems to us, the, the public, I mean, I read the newspapers and it seems like the department is in disarray. I mean, their administrator left, his right hand left. So, you know, who's running the show? I know it's very troubling, especially now when the city is poised to start implementation of its illegal vacation rental enforcement program starting next week. So I am uh, very concerned uh, we, you know, we have not heard exactly how they're going to address some of the, um, the backlog. I know that some of the industry uh, design professionals and, you know, construction industry uh, leaders have met with the mayor and among some of the ideas that have been tossed around to at least tackle the immediate, you know, backlog was to allow for uh, those projects that were being, uh, you know, submitted by licensed architects, you know, where the plans and everything else were pretty much ready to go, that they be allowed to proceed, that, you know, the city not kind of 
force everyone to dot every I and cross every T before allowing them to get into construction. Because typically in a lot of the uh, renovation or construction processing, you know, the, the permit review portion is just the first step. Actual uh, changes and corrective action can actually be taken once a project is underway and you actually see how things are happening on the ground. So, you know, we have uh, a lot of um, residential property owners and others who have been calling us to find out how do we, you know, move our, our projects up in line and we receive the same answers that um, everyone else does. So I think everyone is equally concerned. And, you know, <clears throat> with respect to these projects, I mean, what kind of what what is the backlog really like? And in if they do implement this process by allowing architects to sign off on things, how soon will they implement that so that we can start getting our building permit? That I I can't answer that question, but uh, we're we're happy to put it in writing and send it off to the department and see if we can get something concrete. But we are looking to uh, schedule, you know, schedule meetings with condo stakeholders, condo managers, et cetera, as soon as we can get kind of the uh, the city agencies together to talk about the areas of concern that were identified by many of the people who responded to the um, the fire department report that we circulated among all of the affected buildings. So I, I'm pretty confident that, you know, as we get closer to um, the fact that the city is um, imposing a lot of requirements on individual properties and condo associations without having any kinds of solutions in place, I think they are going to have to either relax some of the requirements or they're going to have to be willing to change the law. So I think that's, you know, really our goal during this next few weeks is to find out specifically, you know, what the city is willing to do, whether they're willing to modify the life safety uh, evaluation types of criteria or eliminate you know the process entirely and allow for a lot of the life safety types of improvements to be considered under the regular state condo regulatory framework because that would seem to be the more appropriate place in trying to address these kinds of issues and then on top of that you know i think there's still the insurance issue which would need to be worked out as between you know the fire department the city and um state insurance commissioner have you heard back from the fire department? I know you said that you contacted them. Have you heard back from them yet? Um, yeah, we did hear from them, but we said, you know, we um, wanted to make sure that we had all of the relevant city agencies at the table. And after we sent the, uh, the letter and, you know, outlined what many of the uh, responses were, uh, they did uh, circulate a uh, press release to say that the deadline for the um, tax credit for uh, fire sprinklers, condo fire sprinklers, uh, the deadline is September 30th, but that was the first time I had ever seen the city send out a notice ahead of the deadline to talk about that tax credit. Of course- But that, only, know, that, only, uh, uh, that only means, uh, that only is, uh, you only get the tax credit if you've got the fire sprinklers, and none of I us know. have fire sprinklers. I know, and so it's really not a solution but you know, I think this is the first time we at least receive some indication that city agencies realize that this whole thing is a ticking time bomb and that they have to really uh, step up to the table and join with the affected parties to craft a solution. Because I and think you know, too, they were yeah. waiting for people to come to them, but you know, everybody is sort of stuck in the same queue. And now that we are aware of all of the building permit delays at DPP, we don't wanna just add another 255 plus buildings to that mix without a solution ahead of time. And you know, one thing that, you know, if you have a hearing on this new bill, uh, we're gonna be testifying that, you know, out of all the municipalities that have a fire sprinkler ordinance, and there are, they are municipalities, they're not state laws. Mm -hmm. You know, Honolulu by far is the largest. Yes, yes, that has one, and they're the only one that's mandating the, the fire. Even Chicago, that's has, correct, has, has an ordinance, but it's they're not mandating. It's kind of like voluntary. That's correct. That's correct. In you, our... you know, so so I, I I don't know if the Chicago bill offers incentives 
for installing it, but you know, to 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 the condo association, at least if it was voluntary, mm -hmm. that means that we we are in charge of our own fate. Yeah, it gives us yep. time to raise the money, you know, and without doing special assessments, and and be and, be, and if it's going to take us four or five years, then we can do other stuff, right. you know, to 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 remedy. Like in my building, you know, for the vertical openings, every time a plumber comes into the building and breaks open the wall and they see, you know, open, you know, for vertical openings, they're told to fill it up because I'm told it's less than a hundred dollars. And I said, fine, tell them to build the association. See, but that's like random. Like whenever they open up a wall to do plumbing repairs, they see the vertical opening. So yeah, maybe after 10 years, we'll have most of them filled, but you know, <laughs> At least we're not breaking open the wall just to do, you know, one, uh, one thing. The vertical openings, right? Which is one of the big deals, uh, one of the big issues regarding the life safety evaluation. Well, that's where I think having a much more comprehensive discussion, you know, among all the people that are affected and the city agencies is really step number one. Because, you know, when we adopted this legislation, I don't think anyone envisioned that we were going to face so many different uh, worldwide, global, you know, kinds of conditions that affected the implementation of this ordinance. You know, it was it was just unheard of to imagine that the world could change so dramatically. And so I think for the city, it's really important to reconsider, you know, what is the most practical way to achieve fire safety for everyone in a manner that's reasonable, you know, because where we are now is really um, putting a huge, huge burden on many property owners for the 255 buildings or the 309 buildings total that are faced with this requirement. And, you know, that's a lot of people. It's over 50,000 units. So if you assume that, you know, there's at least one person per unit, sometimes two, sometimes more, that's a big chunk of Honolulu's population. Right. And, you know, uh, and, 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 you know, the, the fact that, you know, uh, like I said, this local bank, and I don't know if the rumor is true, but if they're, if they're looking at, you know, uh, LSEs that are recorded with the uh, Honolulu Fire Department as indicative of the building's failure to do deferred maintenance, that means those buildings are going to be, be denied loans. You know? That, yeah, that's, that's really not, um, not a fair assessment of what the ordinance requires. And right. so perhaps if... Uh, if there's a way that we can confirm that, you know, I would be happy to follow up with uh, the particular financial institution. And because what I'll do is I'll email it to you because I don't want to make it public. So okay. Like I said, it's a rumor. Okay. And but... it's one of the bigger ones. Okay. Be because I think me. if we can bring them into the discussion and show them how, you know, this whole life safety evaluation process was never intended to take on a life of its own in the manner that is, is happening today. Right. And, and maybe too. And, and, and for our audience, I mean, I know you're working on another bill, yet another <laughs> bill to amend the ordinance. And one of the amendments is going to be changing, you know, the deadline again, because, you know, there's not any way, real way that the building can realistically meet these deadlines. We might want to clarify that the failed LSE reports that are filed with the LSE do not, you know, constitute a defective report relating to deferred maintenance that would trigger the HUD directive, you know, just for clarification. Okay, well, that's where a lot of the comments and feedback that we have received from condo associations, you know, as a result of seeing that fire department report have really some good recommendations. And so if we can put all of them together, I think, you know, it's time for the city to sit down with uh, condo owners and condo managers. And we really do have to uh, take a much different approach to what was envisioned then as having choices, you know, of different types of approaches. Whereas today it's, it's uh, locking everyone into a one size fits all type of solution. Right. And I think that's what's, you know, so frustrating for a lot of the associations mainly because, you know, they don't have the funds. And, you know, this is a common problem with the older buildings. They mm -hmm. don't have funds because, as it is, because they're old, they're doing repairs and maintenance. And now with the supply chain problem, it's costing them more money. 
So, you know, even if they had the money, you know, to put in the fire sprinklers, it's getting used, For you know, to, to do their regular maintenance and repair. And then, you know, that, in, that insurance increase, I mean, that hit us. I mean, we didn't have anything budgeted. And, you know, for my association, I think the first four or five months we were doing, we were running negative. Luckily, we were able, you know, my uh, property manager and site manager, they worked really diligently to, you know, to work on costs. And so now we're in a surplus situation again. And, you know, so, but, you know, uh, I, it, it, it's just, you know, these things keep coming at us. And it's not like, you know, condos have a lot of money. Right. You know, right. We, and when we do the annual budget, it's a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. In other words, the budget is what, you know, is what, you know, the operating budget is what it should cost you to run the, the building. And if you comply with your budget at the end of the year, you have zero in your account. Right. And, you know, the whole and then and, 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 and if you start raising maintenance fees, you know, you get people mad at you because all of a sudden you're raising double digits. And, you know, with an older building, you have to do that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you have a condo collapse situation like you had in Florida. Right. Well, I definitely think that there's ways that, you know, this problem can be solved. And I think it's going to take city and state agencies, as well as legislators working together, because uh, we now have the perfect storm. Oh, and I, I mean, I don't want to say that, you know, um, lightly, but, you know, the things that have been happening this year are all things that were never contemplated at the time ordinance 19-4 was adopted. So it's a good time to revisit it. And if we cannot come to some, you know, kind of common consensus as to the best way to go forward, then I would say it's time to repeal it. And does your bill have a provision for the repeal of the ordinance? We have various drafts. So some drafts, the simplest way to address this issue from a drafting standpoint is to repeal the requirement because the fire code, uh, app the applicability of the fire code within city laws tends to be very broad based. And so if you're going to amend the, you know, the requirements of the fire code that pertain to residential high rises, it becomes a very tricky and cumbersome pro process, you know, and so from a drafter standpoint, they said it would be simpler to repeal the law and then start over with things that you wanted to allow people to proceed with as an incentive. And so for that process, you want to bring everybody together, right. either to talk about amending the existing bill or repealing it and starting all over again. Right, right. And in that type of environment, I think part of what we would want to have is the city and state work together much more proactively because the insurance components are really an important part of what is making it very difficult either to sell, to buy, or you know, otherwise transfer interest in these condominium properties. And okay. that's a that's a really big concern. Okay, for the people who are listening to our listening audience, if they <laughs> want to help, uh, and you know, this bill has not yet been introduced, right? You have it's in the that's draft. correct. That's correct. And you don't expect to uh, 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 introduce it until we have this meeting with the city agencies and right. and 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 the stakeholders. Right. But so when when this bill comes out, and naturally we're going to broadcast it to everybody we can. How can my I, the listening audience help get this bill passed? Well, um, for those that you know have given us comments and feedback, you know, on the fire department report. That was a big help for anyone else who is reviewing the issue. If they share or let us know some of the issues and concerns they have had to face, all of that becomes very valuable because the more that city agencies see just how difficult this whole process is, the more they begin to realize that it's not something that is an easy task for, you know, thousands and thousands of uh, property owners. It's it's really a lot more cumbersome than than we originally envisioned. And would it help for the uh, listeners to contact their their council members and let them know that they have a concern? Sure, we would love that. We would love that. OK, so so that's that's one thing to our listening audience is that you know when we finally get a copy of this bill that gets introduced uh, we will broadcast it to everybody and every and and their, your job would be to contact your 
council member and let them know. And, you know, and, and for planning purposes, do you have like a range of time when you think you'll be able to introduce this bill? At this point, um, it's a little hard to say because I think we want to get the meetings underway immediately. And so the sooner we get those underway, then we'll have a better sense of what's an appropriate time frame, you know, for legislation. Okay. Well, you know, council member, I'm so grateful for you, you know, being on my show today to talk about this. And <laughs> like I said, you've been our champion on this issue, uh, you know, for, for condos. And we really, really appreciate it. And, um, and, 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 and we really are grateful for all the work that you've been doing on this issue. Well, I think it's, it's really, um, it's been a very eye-opening experience because for everybody, anyone who lives in a condo property, you begin to discover that most people have no real uh, idea of just how many challenges condo owners face. You know, whether it's a matter of bulky item pickup types of issues, whether or not it's uh, trash collection issues. And so this fire safety issue was something that I think people thought would be as simple as installing fire sprinklers, you know, in their own homes, but they didn't realize that when you're talking about multifamily high rises that have hundreds of units and thousands of owners, it's a very different animal, very, very different from what, you know, they thought. Okay, well, we, we've run out of time. I, you know, I'm so grateful that you agreed to be my guest today. And like I said, we're always so grateful for the work that you've done. For the con and you have a lot of condos in your district, and that may be why, but that's that's okay. The rest of us really love you for that. And well, so we have good. You have good condo owners, and you actually have a lot of really good condo advocates. You know who have been participating for years on condo issues. So I think that makes a big difference. Thank okay, you. but we need. We, you know, we we also are grateful for champions like you, and because sometimes you know that's not always the case. So I just wanted you to know that you know I've been hearing some good things. And people are very grateful for what you do. I want you to know about it. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Jane. And thanks so much for giving me an opportunity to uh, join you today and talk a little bit about the next step, the next step rather, in tackling these condo fire sprinkler challenges. Okay. And you know, to our listening audience, um, please uh, uh, tune in next week for another episode of Condo Insider. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, mahalo and aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.